uh, uh, even stronger form of uh, PKN principle. Suppose we have, uh, let us say, uh, n. Uh, I think I made a mistake here. This is plus n one plus n two plus n three plus etc plus n k minus k plus one. Okay. So suppose uh, n one plus n two plus n three plus etc n k. So different numbers. I'm just giving minus k plus one balls are put into k boxes. So I have k boxes. And I have some number of balls, right? This is n1 plus n2 plus etc plus nk minus k, right? From each I am subtracting one and then I am just putting one extra, right? So, you know, this is basically n1 minus one plus n2 minus one plus n3 minus one plus nk minus one plus one. These many, whatever that number is, that many balls I am going to throw into each of the different boxes, k boxes. Then either the first box has n1 balls, or maybe that is not the case. Then the second has n2 balls, even that if that is not the case, third box has n3 balls or something, up to kth box has nk balls. One of these must be true. Now all of them cannot be false altogether, right? Because if the first one had only n1 minus 1. Second had only n2 minus 1, etc. Last one had nk minus 1. In total, we have only n1 plus n2 plus nk minus k. The plus 1 will be missing. So, therefore, one of them must satisfy this. So, now this gives you know more structure, right? We are saying that the first one now I can quantify and say that okay, this has n1 minus n1, or this has n2, or this has n3, or etc. I mean, I can change the order also. I can say that you know, first one has n2. I cannot say no, it doesn't matter. But this is something we can we can do. <clears throat> and we can use it uh, to prove more uh, interesting results. So here is a simple, very simple example. So we have we have a you know drawer in the house, right? You know, and then this drawer contains uh, socks of different colors. Every day, I, you know, I go out. I want to let's say put a matching color for my uh, my, my dress, right? The socks must have some the matching color, maybe I don't know. So now, uh, let's say that I have five red socks, seven blue socks, and four gray socks. Now, you know, one day you go to pick up the socks for the next day morning. You want to make it all ready. And then you know there is no power or something and then you you know you are picking up the socks from the drawers in the dark so you can't see the color so the question is that how many socks you need to pick to make sure that you have at least two of the same color because you know i don't want to put a red socks on one leg and the blue socks on the other one right so therefore uh, uh, how many you need to pick to make sure that you have at least two of the same color so <clears throat> this is a problem, you know, very well suited for the generalized version that we are just presenting, the strong form. So you have, uh, you know, n1, n2, n zeta, n k minus k plus one, right? So what are these numbers that we need to figure out, right? What are the balls? Now we know that you know, the socks are going to be the socks are going to be the uh, pigeon, uh, and uh, the colors are going to be the be the pigeon holes, right? Because we need to pick two of the same color. So therefore, uh, uh, you know, we, we can already see that, you know, two of the same color must fall into one box, right? So that must be the blue box or red box or gray box. So, uh, now, what are these numbers that we want to talk about? So we have a red box, we have a blue box and a gray box. So we have K is equal to three. Okay. Then we have n1, n2, and n3, which says that we need at least you need to guarantee there will be either n1 or n2 or n3, right? We need either two of the same color, two of the same color, two of the same color, two red or two blue or two gray, one of them, right? So n1 is equal to n2 is equal to n3 is equal to 2. And therefore, by applying the generalized form, 
the minimum number of socks you need to pick will be n1 plus n2 plus n3 minus k plus 1 right the same thing that we just saw so what is this this is n1 plus n2 plus n3 which is uh, 2 into 3 6 minus k which is 3 plus 1 which is equal to 4 so if you pick 4 socks then definitely one of them uh, one of the colors uh, there will be two of them right because there will be either two red if it is not there there will be two blue that also is not there there will be two uh, gray so that's it so we are now masters of pigeon whole principle right <clears throat> now we want to see some really amazing applications of this theorem we are going to prove uh, a very uh, famous result called Dirichlet theorem. Uh, you know, Dirichlet is the name of mathematician who proved this for the first time at least. Uh, that's what uh, people believe. And uh, this is uh, this is a result from you know analysis. You can say if you want uh, that uh, says the following. Right, you you know you are already familiar with uh, numbers, right? You have integers, you have rational numbers, right? Can be written of the form p by q, where q you not know, equal to zero is a, an integer, right? And uh, then you have uh, real numbers, right? The real numbers are the extension of uh, rational numbers, and uh, you have also numbers which are not rational, right? Called irrational. So irrational numbers doesn't have a p by q form, right? There is no rational form. But what Dirichlet theorem says is that every real number has a very good rational approximation. That is, uh, given any real number and uh, given any epsilon right any any very 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 small number that you give me right like 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 100 zeros and one or something i can find a uh, rational number which is close to this number you know the difference between them will be less than the number that you give me so no matter what's x epsilon you give me i can always find a number even closer so this is the uh, called uh, dirichlet theorem right this is that it's a very good rational approximation as good as you want you can make it as small as the difference can be as small as you want so let us state it in a formal way so you have a, a real number x is given and a natural number n you know positive natural number n is given then you can find two uh, numbers p and q where q not equal to zero such that the difference the absolute value of x minus p by q right p by q is a rational number is less than 1 by n times q less than or equal to 1 by q square so 1 by n q means that n can be arbitrarily large which means that 1 by n q will be arbitrarily small you can make it going to zero like as close to zero as you want so the difference can be as close to zero as you want that's what it says Now, how do you prove something like this using PGN principle, right? That is an interesting question. So, can you prove this? I want you to think about this. So, stop and think about it before you proceed. So, here is the here is the idea. Okay, that uh, no, when we are talking about uh, real numbers, you know. See, real number always have some, you know, integer part, which is not interesting really, right? Because, you know, that integer part is there. Maybe it is the larger part. But the the fractional part is what is making it interesting. And, and we will start by assuming that since the rational number doesn't need a rational approximation because that, that number is, you know, itself a rational number. So, therefore, the difference between the best approximation, which is itself, and that is going to be zero so there is 
so now this is this part is trivial right because this is difference is zero so therefore so we can assume that the number is irrational so for the irrational number the interesting part is the uh, fractional part so let us uh, let us look uh, at the number x given and then look at the fractional part of x. so fractional part of x i rem uh, denote in the uh, 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 flower brackets so this says that i remove the integer part from this right so this is equal to x minus integer part of x <coughs> so <coughs> i take the fractional part now the fractional part is something we know about fractional part is that it is going to be less than one and it's going to be between zero and one right we are talking about positive for the time other way we can just change the sign it's not a big deal <coughs> so we have a uh we have a uh, property that it is going to be between 0 and 1 now this uh, inequality gives us a clue okay this inequality maybe i, I shouldn't use this so this 1 by n cube so 1 by n is something that we can understand right because you give me n 1 by n is a very very small number epsilon <coughs> now if i want to show that you know the difference is going to be less than 1 by n then basically what i am saying is that these two numbers happen to be in an interval of size less than 1 by n right so this is what uh, we are basically saying right in this interval we have uh, <coughs> we have uh, we have uh, these two numbers right the, the number that we are talking about and it's this thing you know they must be as close right so the difference is going to be very small now how do you how do you go about uh, showing this something like this so since we already have a fractional part and i know that it is going to be between zero and one i'm going to subdivide the you know this interval zero one into you know n sub intervals like 0 to 1 by n 1 by n to 2 by n etc n minus 1 by n to n i mean uh, n by n which is 1 right so now i want to somehow bring the settings so that two things are going to fall in the same interval now what are these two things so i need to somehow generate enough things to say that if i want to apply pgn principle i need to generate at least n plus 1 numbers to be able to put it into say that two of them are in the same interval right i'm going to have n intervals as my pgn holds then n plus one numbers must be there so what are these n plus one numbers so that gives the second clue so for that we are going to generate the numbers by using the fact that irrational numbers uh you know even if you multiply with with a, an integer it is still going to be irrational so what i am going to do is that i am going to take you know our irrational numbers x and then multiply uh, it with uh, numbers let's say 1 into x then 2 into x then 3 into x etc n plus 1 oh, it's a problem with this uh, etc n plus 1 into x i mean uh, yeah maybe I, ne I need to use the other bracket so I'm going to yes uh, n plus one into x with the other bracket right so I have uh, generated now n plus one rational numbers I'm looking at the again the fractional part of each of these so I get n plus one different uh, rational uh, numbers these are all related to x also right so we get a relation and the the interesting part is that the, if you look at the coefficients of what you have multiplied with they are in the range 1 to n plus 1 so that the difference is going to be at most n and that is what this uh, uh, 1 by n cube and where our q is going to be in fact between 1 less than or equal to q less than or equal to n okay this is an extra condition that you can give if you want okay <coughs> Uh, B. 
So that gives a, a let's say clue to what is going to be our Q, etc. So what so what we know is that by PJN principle, two of these guys, some AX and BX, right? Some AX and some BX, the fractional part must be belonging to the same interval, whatever some interval. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, so we know that fractional part of ax and fractional part of bx uh, belong to the same interval so that says that a minus b into x minus the integer part of uh, a minus b into x right that is the fractional part right that difference right this is in the same interval which means that this is the difference between these two a minus b into x and integer part of a minus b into x that difference is uh, less than a is okay is less than uh, 1 by n because they belong to the same interval now why it's strictly less because these numbers can never be in the boundary because they are irrational numbers and 1 by n, 2 by n, etc. are rational numbers. So the fractional part will never be even the boundary, so it will be strictly inside. So if it is in one interval like this, then we know that they are going to be strictly inside, so the difference is strictly less than 1 by n. Now things are easy. So I am going to put a minus b uh, as uh, <coughs> q. So q into x, because a minus b is going to be between 1 and n. Uh, n now because the numbers are from 1 to n plus 1 right so a minus b is equal to q and uh, this integer part of a minus b into x whatever it is to be p okay? it's integer part so that's an integer so qx minus p right less than 1 by n so dividing throughout by q because q is non-zero right i have taken distinct numbers a and b the difference is going to be non-zero and uh, it is going to be uh, in the range 1 to n so therefore this is dividing throughout by q i get absolute value of x minus p over q is less than 1 by n q but now because q is in the range 1 to n this is less than or equal to 1 by q square and that's what we wanted to prove so we have proved the uh, Dirichlet theorem by applying the general principle by considering the intervals uh, 0 1 by n etc as the pgn holds and the numbers that we generated right by multiplying this number this and taking the fractional part as the pgns and this is what requires some ingenuity this is what we uh, that uh, that makes the uh, pgn principle difficult to apply because we need to figure out which are the PGNs and which are the PGN holes, and that is not always the easy job. Okay, so I, I hope that you have uh, uh, cleared up the question. If there is any thing, just think about it and let me know. Now, <clears throat> another very, very important result and very, very interesting application. Uh, of the PGN principle. This is uh, Erdos uh, Shakaras theorem. Okay, so uh, this theorem, I mean, uh, we can prove it using the generalized uh, form uh, or the strong form, but I want to use the other form for the time being because it gives a different flavor to it. Right? It gives a different way in approach. It's a very beautiful approach. So the erdos shakaras theorem uh, says the following. Suppose you are given uh, n uh, numbers in a sequence. Okay? So like you have a1, a2, a3, etc. in some order. Now this n happens to be a number which is uh, greater than or equal to r into s plus 1 for some positive integers r and s. Okay? So r and s are numbers. So r into s plus 1 is some number and n is at least r into s plus 1 maybe larger <clears throat> now no matter what the number that you have given me right so these are distinct numbers no matter what you know order 
that you have given me this number, you can show that the sequence contains either an increasing subsequence of r plus 1 times or a decreasing subsequence of s plus 1 times. And what is an increasing subsequence? You, you take the sequence as it is and just remove some of the elements from there. What remains is a subsequence. And if this subsequence, every number right in the sequence, in the order whenever you go to the right, it increases. That is an increasing subsequence. A decreasing subsequence is exactly you take a subsequence, but it decreases each time. Now, what the Erdős uh, Chakras theorem says is that uh, you can find either uh, an increasing subsequence of uh, at least uh, s plus uh, at least r plus one uh, numbers or a decreasing subsequence of s plus one numbers this is something that you can always do now how do you uh, go about proving something like this see in the earlier one suppose we want to use the uh, you know the, the first form that we studied right rather than the uh, the general form here we have uh, uh, you know several uh, several uh, things that you want to show, right? You want to show either R plus 1 or S plus 1. Right? General form allows this. But let's try to use the other form. How do you, can you use the previous form to do this? That requires some thinking. So why don't you pause and think about it? Okay. Now, <clears throat> so to do this, I'm going to uh, you know, look at the sequence and then do some analysis. Okay, so I want to an is given, but I am going to because whatever you are going to give me, I have the collection, right? I want to an. Now I am the one who want you give me the sequence. I will go. Uh, I am going to show you that I can produce either a decreasing subsequence or an increase subsequence of this many times. Right? So you you have given me this thing. I am going to look at the sequence and study it. Now what I am going to do is that I count the number of uh, you know or the length of the longest increasing subsequence that starts from a number okay suppose if i look at the position let us say a2 right now if i look at a2 i start from a2 and look at what is the maximum uh, you know the subsequence that you can create which increases so from a2 after a2 i can only select numbers which are larger than it right then I can select only numbers larger than that, etc. Right? So I look at this and see how many I can select. This I can do, right? Whatever. I'm just going to make an argument, right? So I'm going to say that whatever is that number, that I will call as Xi. So Xi is the length of the longest increasing subsequence starting at AI. Right? So from A2, this is X2. From A3, it is X3, etc. And it is Xn. Right? From A1, it is X1. So I, you know, I have this xi. Then I also look at the longest decreasing subsequence that ends at ai. Now that is the clever part. Okay. So look at the uh, decreasing subsequence, but not starting from a2, but that ends at a2, right? Not starting at an, but ending ending at an. So what is the longest uh, decreasing subsequence ending at ai? So this is ya. Now what is the property of uh, or, or the advantage of selecting something like this is that uh, if I, you know, if I look at the number that we are deciding now, right, for corresponding to AI, I have this number as XI and YI. Now, suppose I select any other number, let's say AJ, you know, J different from I, right, I have XJ and YJ. Now, if I look at xi and xj, maybe xi and xj are the same, right? That is possible, right? Because xi uh, is the length of the increasing subsequence starting, starting from uh, xi and uh, I mean ai and uh, xj is the one starting from aj. Maybe from, you know, whatever is the longest sequence starting from ai is the same as the one starting from aj. That is possible, right? So xi can be equal to xj. Similarly, ya can be equal to yj, right? That is also possible, right? For any number, 
you know the decreasing subsequent sending at ai and aij could be the same because after that everything is larger then i cannot do anything right whatever i have selected from ai that is it next one is all smaller i mean larger so i cannot select anything so therefore it can be the same but what i know is that xi yi and xj yj as ordered pair can never be the same why is that so if i select xi comma yi that says that xi is the length of the uh, long uh, largest increasing subsequent starting from ai and ya is the length of the decreasing subsequent that ends at y now when i go to aj what happens suppose xi does not increase then yj will increase because the numbers are distinct if xi does not increase then yj mean so the, if xi does not increase that means that the number is uh, going to be uh, smaller so therefore yj will increase otherwise if xi increases then yj i mean you know like if, if yj uh, doesn't change then the xi will change right one of them will change now because of this as ordered pairs they will never be the same right i mean this number and this this ordered pair and this ordered pair will never be equal as ordered pairs so this is never equal so this helps us to uh, you know design uh, a pigeon hole uh, application so what you do is that we know that these numbers xi and yj can never be more than n because you know maximum number of times is n right so longest increasing subsequent can only be at most n decreasing also can be at most n so i'm going to plot it in a, a graph like you know i take an n by n square then i'm going to put you know the numbers here right you know xi you know so this is the position it's going to the uh i so that is like uh, you know 1 2 etc up to n and 1 2 etc up to n so this says that you know this is the where i am going to plot x is and this is where i am going to plot y is right uh so how i am going to do that well i take x i y j for any number and whatever is the number i am going to mark it right so this guy this guy this guy whatever i am going to so the corresponding numbers i am going to put here right the ordered pairs x i y j i am going to put if that pair is appearing i am going to put a cross mark wherever it is now what i know is that because uh, n is greater than or equal to r into s plus 1 okay let me look at the sub uh, you know rectangle of size s and r okay if i am going to look at the s into r sub uh, sub rectangle here this rectangle will contain n boxes right this rectangle will contain n boxes because that is s into r boxes are there uh, you know uh, will contain s into r boxes right it can contain only uh, not n boxes it can contain at most s into r boxes but n is greater than s into r right it's at least s into r plus 1 so therefore even if you fill up all these boxes with rows you will still have some uh some rows that must appear outside this box it must can appear either here or maybe here or maybe here whatever right now if the you know the rows appearing here means that for some pair x i y j right uh you know the xi had crossed r right which means that the longest increasing subsequence is greater than r plus 1 greater than or equal to r plus 1 if it was here yj had crossed s so therefore the longest decreasing subsequence is at least s plus 1 and similarly if it is here both might have happened right you know, the longest decreasing subsequence as well as increasing subsequence is larger than r plus 1 and s plus 1 so this are the uh, possibilities and using the pigeon hole principle right these the boxes as the pigeon holes and the crosses as the pigeons in the ordered pairs of the pigeon we can show that uh, erdos chakra theorem holds and this is a very 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 beautiful and very ingenious application of the pigeon hole principle right
Okay. <clears throat> now, time for homework. Uh, I will give you some questions. As I mentioned earlier, you need to look at uh, more questions from the textbook. Uh, I would recommend to go through all the questions and try to solve as many as you can. Uh, but at least try to do you know, half of them, something like that. So here are the homework questions. Uh, first question uh, is, uh, let S be any n plus 1 element subset of the set 1 to 2n. Okay. So you have an n plus 1 element subset of 1 to 2n. So there is a 2n element set, exact precise set 1 to 2n. So that there are two numbers a and b in S such that a divides b. This is a very classic result of Erdor. Uh, I want you to think about proving this rather than trying to look it online. You will find it very easily online, but don't bother with that, right? Try to try to find out a, a solution yourself. Uh, and it uh, is it's fun okay believe me it is going to be challenging but it will be fun now so this is that any n plus one element subset of this set will contain two elements such that one divides the other but what is even stronger one can show is that if you take some s element i mean n element subset that need not be the case so give me an example of an n element subset of 1 to 2n where you cannot find two numbers with this property right so that is the first question then show that given any positive integer n there is some integer k such that the digits of uh, k times n okay so it's a multiple of n right are a sequence of ones and zeros we are not talking about uh, you know binary representation because any number has it can be written in sequence of ones and zeros but not that in the decimal system itself i can find you know a multiple right let us say that uh, you take uh, 37 you know that 111 is a multiple of 37 right so this way uh, but maybe like 100 117 111 and zero right if you want both ones and zeros, you can add zeros, of course, right? So, I want you to show that uh, there is a, uh, there is always a multiple. No matter what number you give me, you can always find a multiple with uh, all the digits are just ones and zeros. <clears throat> Another question that uh, is... Uh, Given a sequence a1 to a n of positive integers, show that uh, for some i and j between 1 and n, 1 less than or equal to i less than or equal to j less than or equal to n, a i plus a i plus 1, etc., a j is divisible by n. So there is a subsequence of consecutive terms whose sum is divisible by n. Okay, so that is the third question. And the fourth question is that uh, show that if n plus 1 integers are chosen from uh, the set 1 to uh, 3n, okay. So I, I use this square bracket notation to denote uh, the elements from 1 to that number, right? Whatever. If k is a positive integer, this says that we are talking about the set 1, 2, 3, etc., up to k. Okay. So when I say this, this is basically 1 to 3n, 1, 2, 3, etc., 3n. So, if you look at n plus 1 integers from 1 to 3n, then there are always 2 which differ by at most 2. Okay. And the next question is that given any set of 52 integers, there exists 2 of them whose sum or whose difference is divisible by 100. Okay. So, now it's slightly different, right? Either the sum or the difference is divisible by 100. So can you show this? It needs little more thinking than the previous one. It's not very difficult. And sixth question, given 10 uh, persons whose age is a whole number between 1 and 60, prove that one can find two groups of people disjoint, having the sum of their ages equal. 
Okay. Can we replace 10 with a smaller number? Yes or no? And justify whatever you say. Right? If it is yes, you need to give justification. If it is no, you have to give again, give justification.